All right, everybody, good evening and welcome to this evening's webinar. We have uh, most of an hour together today, uh, this evening, talking about one of my favorite topics, executive functioning. Uh, I do believe it's a very important topic. I think it's useful uh, in all aspects of our lives, uh, more important than ever, I think, in this uh, current environment of education, in the current marketplace, um, the world of work. We're going to do, oh yeah, a little bitty uh, poll just to start things off, get a sense of who you are. Um, are you a student, a parent, a guardian, ed educator? Click one of those. Um, do you have a student in one of those grades? Click one of those. Um, do you guys want any help from Apple Ruth? Just, uh, and then finally, do you want someone to reach out? If so, yes, no. And then you close it. That's it. That was a matter of all of 18 seconds. All right, so let's let's rock and roll. Um, a, a few notes in terms of for the evening. Um, I'm going to go through some slides and, and talk some too, just kind of chat and, and go through my deck. Um, we will uh, share with you a PDF of the deck. So that's going to be coming your way. Don't worry about writing down things on the slides unless you, you, know, you want to, to remember this evening. Um, and also we'll send a recording of this to you as well if you want to share it with your um, with your partner, your spouse, uh, or your kids, talk through things. Um, and we'll also for sure have time for Q&A at the end. I like having Q&A. So let's discuss the executive functioning. What is it? Why does it matter? Um, we, we framed it as the, the hidden curriculum. And I really believe there is a lot of, uh, you know, validity to that, that phrasing, the framing of things. Because ultimately, I mean, I've been teaching this to students for, for years, um, more or less 20 years, 21 years, and um, calling it executive functioning the past several years, but I've been doing this for a long time, even, you know. And ultimately, if you teach kids how to succeed, how to think about systems, how to manage their resources, how to get help, how to estimate time demands, um, you know, how to stay on top of their things, it's gonna help them in everything. Um, doesn't matter the class, it's not teaching someone physics or chemistry. It's giving them a strategy for success, both in academics and in their activities out of school, uh, and in their summer internships and applying to college and getting a job. Um, I've been working with kids uh, in terms of um, with EF skills um, from a 10 year old to my most recent student this summer. Uh, I just wrapped up with one of my high school, I'm sorry, college rising seniors. He'll be 22 years old over at AM. Um, and uh, ultimately, like every, every stage from when you're 10 to when you're 22 to when you're 40, if you are strong, in executive functioning, it's going to make your life easier. You're going to have less chaos, less stress, typically more success, uh, and life's just a little better. And the nice thing is these are skills. Uh, it's not so much this person, you know, innately is an EF rock star and can manage and this, this frontal cortex is so developed and baked, but there are, you know, if someone is still not developmentally fully mature with these brain regions, you can put in place supports and scaffolds and structures and systems to help them get better. And that's part of what I do and what our team does with, with our coaching. So let's, let's dive in and talk about what this is, how this works. Um, and many of you, you know, probably know the term already. It's definitely getting currency, getting traction in the past few years. But, you know, it's been framed under other things, conscientiousness or follow through from, from, for many, many years, knowing that this really does matter for, for outcomes academically and beyond. So defining it, what is this? The executive functions, the series of processes, they lie in the frontal cortex. The last, this is the, the last part of the brain to develop um, you know, over time. This, the frontal cortex is still developing in, into our mid twenties. And in terms of social, emotional learning, emotional regulation peaks in our thirties. Um, the ability to tamp down you know, reactivity to inhibit emotions and feelings. But you know, the ability to manage resources, time estimate, plan, prioritize, structure, this gets better. And I, I have a two-year-old and watching her even picking up from you know one and a half to two and watching her kids from two to 10, 10 to 15. Often I'm, I, I tell my parents, uh, I, I work with, I'm working with their kids, you know, there's students struggling in ninth grade, 10th grade. But honestly, even without my work uh, and you know, the, your, your son in three years from now at 19 or 20 would, just, would be better at this than he is at 15. So he's struggling, you know, he's having these failing out of some classes in freshman year. Like there are, Things are going to develop even without support, but we can definitely fast track it and avoid some pain um, over the next few years. But the brain is, is wiring, developing, neural connections are forming, strengthening, 
Um, and that, that, that gets better until you're about 25 years old. Just know that. So these are skills um, that can be developed and improved and enhanced. Um, the, the, the big pieces, time management, self-regulation. Can I manage myself and not get pulled in to the game I was playing, to my social media I was on, to my, I mean, the, the phones are the biggest challenge for executive functioning. As all of you know, every parent, I see it, if I'm a few years out with my kid being two, but I look at all my, my siblings and my, their, their kids are 12 and 13 and 14 and watching these negotiations about the boundaries around the phones. Um, because the phones can, can commandeer a lot of energy, a lot of energy and resources. And so, you know, self-monitoring, um, inhibition, can I inhibit my desire to go and pick this thing up again when I have work to do? Um, goal setting, follow through, organization, um, planning, and undergirding all of these things are the, there's self-control, cognitive flexibility, pivoting, shifting, changing, um, working memory to I remember, oh yeah, um, I remember that before I go to this class, I have to bring this book or write this down or put the bag into the locker, lock the locker. Um, and, you know, young kids are often going to be making bigger mistakes. They'll be forgetting their stuff, their clothes, their bags. But even I have some kids who are 17 who are forgetting their things. Their parents are on me uh, or not on me. They're, they're saying my kids has a challenge or my son or daughter just spends way too long in the bathroom, is always late to everything. And then, you know, part of these are, you know, time management planning, you know, and, and some people are just going to take a long time in the bathroom until they're 50. <laughs> so it's, um, but ultimately what I'm focused on more is what uh, confers an advantage or uh, relates to success academically. Uh, not so much they spend too long in the bathroom, but some parents write me notes about this. So it's kind of funny for me sometimes. Uh, now, if, if you were to actually, you know, take a, a temperature of your own skill set as a parent, um, how good are you at planning one to 10? Um, how good are you at prioritization? Um, and, you know, how good are you at organization? Some people who are really good at prioritizing, still they're, you know, not as organized. Um, time management, there are folks who really are amazing at planning, but then their time orientation is not great. They're, they're time optimists, or they think they can do one more thing and they can't, and they always push themselves to be late. Uh, I have some of that, you know, in my mid-late 40s. That's still one of my things that, that's been, in, it's been there for a long time. And I put in place supports and structures, and I use calendars and reminders and uh, alarms, but ultimately, it's not as easy for me as for some people who are just really good at that. Um, but again, these are still skills, so I know I, I can always improve. Self-regulation, self-monitoring. Um, and there's no hierarchy. There's no, this is a more important skill. These are all dis discrete, distinct skills. Um, if your student has a diagnosis of ADHD, or if you do as a parent, or if anyone takes a frontal stimulant, you know, the Concerta or the Adderall or the Ritalin, um, they are going to have challenges here. If, if you have challenges with ADHD, by definition, um, you have challenges with executive functioning, especially when it comes to inhibition and distraction, self-regulation, self-monitoring. So these things go hand in hand. And there are a lot of kids I work with who do have a diagnosis for ADHD, but not all though, um, by no means all. So um, Peg Dawson's great uh, author of a book who frames these skills in two groupings, like a very base level skills, work memory to remember a yeah, task when I'm doing something else, to manage your emotions, keeping your attention on something, um, starting a task. And then she frames them as the advanced skills are the higher level things of planning, knowing what am I going to need, when, how long, prioritization, organization, time management is a big one. Um, and my, my students who are often, they come and they're struggling and there's chaos, need work with this. Um, like starting a task, keeping your attention focused, planning and estimating how long things take. Sometimes they're starting something Thursday night, that's due Friday, and they realize they need help and resources, they should have started planning on Tuesday. Um, and so my thing is getting them shifting and avoiding the whole last minute craziness. And then the final, um, there's persistence towards a goal, which is a big deal. And the capstone of all of this is called metacognition. It's a big word, but it means you become aware, you know, meta high level of your own thinking. Um, you have a sense of how you think, your self-awareness. Um, you, you go, oh, I've been here before. I remember this pattern in myself. I tend to think I'm ready, but I'm really not. So it's the, the ability to go to a higher level and understand the, the kind of errors and mistakes you tend to make. Um, I typically go into these things un, uh, unprepared. I, I tend to underestimate timing. That's metacognition, knowing yourself, knowing I, I'll probably need help in, in about uh, you know, two chapters. That's the, it's awareness. Um, and kids who get better at this get better at school and get better at life. So I mean, it's really a major skill. Um, and what I've seen, and I've gotten feedback from parents, I've, I've worked with their students, that getting better at executive functioning organization planning, probably helps you in school, 
but much more than that, it helps you in life. Um, if you learn how to use a calendar uh, and really use it in a way that helps you and, and supports you and your success, if you learn how to estimate and do I need help, how do I get help? Who could help me? Um, that, that's Again, it helps with getting a, a B, not a C in physics, but also it'll help you follow them through with, with, with sports and activities and internships and making sure you turn something in on time when you're you know, looking at campus housing when you're a junior in college, all these things, um, they're beneficial. So if you, if you get better at this, it carries over. Um, these, these generalize out. Um, and so this is really, you know, this, there are adults getting life coaching and getting um, EF coaching as well. So this is not just for, for young people. Um, there's another construct I was exposed to in grad school called self-regulated learning. That's the ability to manage your own learning. And there's a lot of overlap here um, in terms of strategies, time management. And there's, again, a lot of overlap, conscientiousness, EF, self-regulation. There's definitely a lot, if I were to draw like a Venn diagram, there's plenty of overlap in these, these, these contents. Um, and again, the capstone I mentioned, uh, metacognition, I think it's a huge piece, knowing it's time for a break. And to me, like a, a big thing here is when I'm reading a book and I'm going through the chapters and I read, it's like, you know what? I just read this whole page and I have no clue what I read. That's metacognition. That's when it's like, oh, it's time for me to, to have a break. If I keep reading this book, I'm getting nothing out of this. And that's you know a level of knowledge of, okay, I've been reading for half an hour, an hour. I'm tired, need a break. My glucose stores are depleted. That's a level of awareness which will help a student do, do well in, in, in all areas. So, and knowing also, I'm just not getting this book. Uh, who can I ask? Who would actually is an expert higher level, not one of my friends or buddies on, on Snapchat, but someone who actually will be able to help me and know who, who actually is the resource. That's again, metacognition. And you know, knowing how you learn, knowing typically I underestimate. These are all really big skills. And one of the big things when you're working with a young person and you're trying to build their executive functioning, you're gonna be asking them questions. You're gonna be asking them to reflect. The whole thing is about reflection because you as a parent or me as an uh, EF coach, I can't get inside of their head and diagnose, but I, and, and a part of it, if I tell them the answer, that isn't that helpful either because they're gonna, then I, I become a crutch or you as a parent become a crutch. And, and part of it, we're, we're more effective and more helpful and things generalize more when we ask the right questions to have the students think, reflect and, and have their own answers and develop. Then they really, that, that's actually really help them versus if I'm the guru, I'm not really doing a great job as an EF coach or you know, it's like, then they look to me and they don't feel empowered. What my, my role is, is to work myself out of a job. And you as parents is to help your kids become more independent. Um, and more self-sustaining versus they always look to you to help them make sure things are turning on time and don't forget their assignments that, you know, that's not because eventually they all go to college. And when I'm seeing again and again with my students in high school, like when, when, they're, when they're in college, it's up to them. And so if the parents are playing too much of a supporting role, that's when we see real challenges. I've seen kids getting Fs, you know, A, B students in high school having struggles when they rely too much on home supports. Um, so you want kids to be independent and, you know, autonomous. That's, that's the game plan. So self-awareness, huge piece. You have to know what you're good at. Um, also know what you're not good at. Hugely important. Have a level of humility. Um, but no, I'm vulnerable. You know, I really seem to have a hard time uh, with people with accents. Um, I have several students. It happened twice um, last year. One person couldn't understand their physics teacher. One, it was a college level, but you know, their, their calc teacher and they should, you know, needed to either get help, change classes, get support, get the notes from the teacher, knowing what, you know, what I'm, I'm really good at language or I struggle with this. That, that's a huge part uh, of this. What are my strengths? Where are my challenges? Um, and if you know what you're good at, you know, that it's gonna really help you. Even if kids feel like uh, I'm falling apart, I try to point them towards their strengths, what they are good at um, to help build our sense of self esteem, self efficacy, that uh, it's not just things are, you know, so I watch their self-talk if they sell themselves out and say, I stink at this. It's like, well, let, let's, let's pull back. Are there any areas, any pieces that, that you actually, you know, are good or competent or capable of, not globally, I stink at math. Uh, things like that, or I'm just bad at studying or bad at tests. I, I never let a student have that general or global of, of, a, of a self, uh, you know, concept. Um, and so, we're gonna teach them to reflect what, what worked, what didn't work. Okay, so you prep for this thing, you got a 63 on the exam. Let's talk about, you know, how'd you prep, when, you know, what was going on? Um, what would you have done differently this time around? What can you learn from this? So there are gonna be setbacks. Every single time, like, I had a student I work with, he's the guy over at, uh, at Texas A&M, 
And he had a, a semester where he failed two classes last, last semester. So he came to me and initially out of the gate, his goal was, I want to get all A's. Um, I'm like, okay, and I'm going to meet you where you are. You, you, had, you had two F's and a bunch of C's. Um, you're on academic probation. Um, and ultimately, you don't, want to, you, know, you don't want to fail out of school. But he comes to me and says, my goal is I want to get a 4 i I'm like, okay. And I, I met him where he was and how do we plan to get there? Um, you know, knowing that was definitely going to be a lift. Like, what are your classes this semester? And over the course of the semester, like, he began to do some things and dig some holes. But ultimately, at the end of it, the, 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 you know, the goal was, I want, to, I, want to, I want to fail nothing, which would be a big step up from the previous semester, and ultimately have, you know, two Bs, two Cs. And that was a lot better than, you know, two Cs, two Fs. Um, so ultimately, I'm working with them, matching them, meeting with them. But every, you know, when my student came to me and said, I, I didn't do the, the, the homework, I, I got a 60 on that test. It's not any element of shame or, you know, you let me down or it's not, not at all. It's okay. Let's talk about, you know, what happened, what worked, what do you need the next time? It's constantly next time, next time. There's never judgment on my part. And it's tougher as parents because as, as, a, as a coach, I'm not tied in. I haven't watched them since they were born. And uh, parents, there's, there's more expectation. But part of it for me, I maintain the currency of, you know, I can motivate them more effectively if they feel like I'm not, you know, I'm not judging or shaming them for their mistakes. But I meet them like, okay, what can we learn? This, it happened. It's, it's, it's totally fine. I know that that's a little bit harder for parents. I get that having my own, my own kid. Um, but that is the more you can come without judgment, the more they're going to see you as, you know, an ally, a resource versus if, if you come with judgment and shame, I'm going to hide things from you. you know, I'm not going to come to you and I need help if you're going to judge me. And that's, that's you know, that's a, a piece of it as, as coaching. So curiosity, when there are setbacks, reframe it. What happened? And every single student I work with, there are setbacks. There isn't a single, even my kids who get, you know, their best GPA, some parents said it's their best GPA we've had in four years. Um, but then things still happen. That my, one of my students applying to Northeastern got in, is going to the fall. He was doing this online class and he wasn't turning assignments. He got behind and we talked about it. So, you know, things are okay. And we learned that a C was actually, it was, it was a, it was a pass fail class. So suddenly it's like, all right, we're not going to get an A in this class, but you know what? A C is the same as an A, um, but don't get an F because then everything's worth nothing. But we, we talked about what, what happened. What did we learn from this for next year? Because a teacher doesn't remind you, you have to be more on top of it. So this is a college level class. What have we learned for next year? Um, that it's really more on you to make sure you go in there and contribute to the dialogue. And if you don't, if they, they talk points. So failure is going to happen. Setbacks are going to happen. Mistakes are going to be part of the work all the way through from the beginning to the end. Um, but part of it, we stay strategic. And again, we look at these as opportunities. It really is, is a big piece. A quick thing I throw in there, Kathleen Kears, I like her a lot. Um, when she's working with students, it's kind of a lower level thing, but chunk to check. When you're trying to learn something, um, after every 10 minutes, you have to stop and like, you know, what are you learning? What are you reinforcing? Well, let's do some self-testing. And I do a lot of this with my kids. I do a lot of, you know, chewing and checking. Um, so we're looking at, you know, stuff for the week and what did you learn? Step back. Uh, I always, you know, make them respond to, you know, what did you get from this? And so we do some reflection every few minutes on honestly working with my kids. John Dewey, a very important philosopher, educator, I think her American um, education, you don't learn from experience, but you learn from the reflection upon the experience. And I, I've seen that a thousand times, kids who keep making mistakes, getting apps until you stop and really get it and really understand why and how and what is the pattern, you tend to keep doing it. Um, and so that the reflection, oftentimes kids who are not great at EF uh, out of the gate are not great at the stopping and building in the forced reflection. But if you get into that habit, it makes you a better student, um, really important. So. We have to teach students that things are going to change all the time. You're going to have a new semester, a new teacher. What was amazing for pre-calc doesn't work at all for pre-calculus. That teacher was lovely, native English speaker, amazing. This teacher is not. This teacher is so part of it is, you know, where are you sitting in the classroom? How are you prepping for them? You have to be able to shift and adjust and change. And what worked then won't, especially as you go, you know, there are definitely pain points that I see in terms of executive functioning when the demands upon a student keep increasing. Um, one of the big transitions, my, my oldest nephew is going through, through this eighth and ninth grade. Suddenly the work level increases. Suddenly there's more homework, things shift. We are in high school now. Then there's also a big pivot when you go from sophomore to junior. The junior year curriculum, for one, it's the most important year of high school in terms of college admissions. Uh, and your grades there matter the absolute most. But also 
you're taking more AP classes, higher level classes, the workload increases. And often what worked pretty well at ninth, okay, for 10th, when you're a junior, if you don't have good skills and systems, things can fall apart. And I've seen this again and again. And then the next big transition is gonna be uh, going to college um, when suddenly it's you and you're out there. And if your resources systems, if you were totally reliant upon mom to tell you when things were due, now you're out there and you can flounder a bit. Um, and so these are three of the big areas where I think the EF skills may be challenged and where some students need some scaffolding, some support to help them uh, beef up their skills before you launch them out again. Um, but again, you know, there's going to be, you have to, you have to adapt. There's going to be some things that are frustrating. How do I work with this? How do I take on new challenges? And one thing is the framing of this. Kids who are struggling, sometimes they're perceived as being, uh, they're, they're not motivated or they're lazy. Uh, my kids who are getting Fs. But part of it, when you start to really scratch at what the surface, what's going on here? And there is a drive in a lot of these kids, but there's also a sense of frustration. There's a sense of there have been past failures when they've applied their energies and efforts, and, and they've just learned that you know, things aren't going to work, and they get easily frustrated. Um, but these kids, ultimately, what I, can see, I see here is it's not they don't care. It's there, you know, there really is a skill deficit that you know, when they hit a setback, the way they manage it, the, the, their skill of managing some frustration, some distress, their distress tolerance, like they go to a, a place where we'll forget it, it stinks, I'm giving up, versus what can I learn from this? Uh, how, do I, how can I pivot? How can I get more support, more help? And teaching them how to manage setbacks more, more, more skillfully. So you give them skills and strategies, and then the motivation, it's, it's there. Um, and so I mentioned before, a very, very little shame. Um, and when there's a challenge, it's an unsolved problem. That's a really lovely way to frame things. Not a deficit, not you're not good at this, not you always forget this, but this is, a, you know, how do we resolve this, this challenge? This is a problem we're trying to solve. Um, there's more curiosity. Um, Wendy Bartignoli, I like her stuff. Um, working with students, I, I work a lot with them on their study environment. Where they're working, where they're studying, it varies for high school kids. Some of them find a downstairs room, some of them work in their upstairs room, but they keep their phones away. One of my students you know, in college, he's like, if I, I do better when I go to campus than when I stay in my room, there are more distractions here, I'm more focused there. One of my students last year, another college kid, he was he did better at the library with other, you know, he, was, he had some frat people. Uh, it was like a, a more of an academic fraternity. And if I'm there and they're there, I do better, I get more done. Then I can kind of pull and draw from their energy. And it's funny, he had forgotten that, but he felt the same way in high school. And he struggled during COVID because he, you know, he was working at home and his grades went, went pretty far south because he always has better working with someone else he could see working too. So again, there's no right or wrong. It's just, if that's what you need, that's what you need. Understand yourself. Um, so this, he needed more stimulation. He needed seeing someone else. He called it a body double. And he found that at college last year um, out in Colorado. Um, and so you have to have the right amount of visual stimulation, but for some people, too much is really no good. Some kids need to move. One of my students uh, two years ago needed to move and he would like bounce a ball off the wall. Totally fine. Um, as long as you're not bothering someone else, you bounce your ball, getting a little bit of, you know, you're having to, to inhibit the, the desire to move your hand. Um, hearing, I need, you know, I'm distracted pretty easily with sound, you know, sensory, you know, the way I manage auditory processing. So I play music, which uh, with, a, with a beat, electronic music, and I, I, I drown out external sounds or my daughter chattering in the background helps me focus. I'm trying to really work her right. Uh, and then, you know, smells, tastes. Again, some people, they hear, uh, they smell a strong perfume. They can't function as well. So it's knowing how big is your, your sensory cup. That was the framing of, of Wendy. It's like, if I have a little cup for sound, and then like, you know, for me, if I hear a clock ticking, it'll really upset me. And I have, a, I'll focus, I'll attend to the clock ticking and, and that'll take away energy from my paper I'm trying to write. And so actually at Apple Roof, tutoring, um, when we first put up our office, I got rid of every clock that had a, a sweeping hand or ticked and I got smooth or, or silent clocks and I, it was better for me because the way my mind is, I just pick up a lot of things. And there's no, again, there's no judgment of I'm broken. It's just my brain is very attuned and very sensitive um, to certain stimuli. So it's not, so it's understanding that if I'm going to optimize my time, my studying, I have to work with, my, with the brain that I have. And that's a, that's a real nice framing of this, to, to really work with the brain that you have and how to optimize the brain that you have. When we work with students who, on the, I'm sorry, that was my phone I dropped. Um, students on the spectrum of autism, 
we work with um, students with ADHD, we work with all kinds of students with sensory auditory processing. It's just, what brain do you have? How do you optimize it? And then the sensory game is part of it too. Um, some of the things, I'll throw out some of the keys for coaching EF students. Um, I, I've, I've already hit some of these notes, but it's, it's so much about the relationship and, and trust. And so if you're trying to help your, your, your kids, um, they have to feel like you know, you're really on their side, you're not gonna come down on them. Um, even though you know you want them to do well, but you're you know, you're a resource. You're going to be trying. I, I tell them all, I am a resource to you. That's my role. And ultimately, you you know you have to. And when my students come to me and say, I'm I'm downgrading my goals. I, I wanted to get all A's. Now it's A's and B's. Now it's I don't want to fail. It's like to me, it's okay. I'm here to support you in this. Um, you know, ultimately, it, you know, would I love all A's? Sure, but this is again, this is your academic career. And you know, you're gonna live with the grades you get and it's not my grades, these are, but I wanna help you get the best you can based on what you want for yourself. Um, Sharon Celine, I've given many talks with Sharon. She's a, an author, expert on ADHD, talks about collaboration. And one of the things I like here is a celebration that when there are wins, victories, even small ones, calling attention to them, um, noticing them, because often kids ignore them or brush them off. But I really call attention when there's positive progress, when things are going well, even in a small way, I give a lot of high fives and a lot of reinforcement. And that, that's you know, part and parcel of the work of coaching, supporting, reinforcing. Um, and we're again, we're all working together, we're problem solving together, we're modeling, and we're we're showing them how do you solve problems. Like this is, you know, this is the problem of physics. This is the problem of um, a heart, a remote class, you're struggling. This is a problem, but then there are gonna be other problems. But by modeling for them, you know, so what have you tried? What's worked? What are, you know, who else in the class is doing better? What do you think they're doing? Have you talked to your teacher? What, have you gone online? Like, you know, how teach them how do you problem solve when you come across a because they're going to hit hard things in school, in their work life, and you're showing them how to how do you solve problems, which to me is very powerful. This is good modeling. Um, and then skill building again, you're trying to you don't want to be the guru, you want to be the you know, the supporting coach. And do you have any ideas? What have you tried? What do you think? Um, like, you know, we're we're showing them. Um, you know, ways to think. And then in terms of planning, Jack Naglieri, also another researcher, um, encouraging kids to think about how they're doing um, what they're doing. So it's like the how is, you know, how did you begin? What were your strategies? What will you do next time? Again, a lot of this, the reflection and the future planning. Um, incrementalism is a big piece where you're celebrating even the small stuff, little bits of progress, um, you acknowledge them, you went from a 67, you know what, now you're actually 70 or the cusp of passing, that's progress. And I'm gonna, you know, even if my goal was a B, I'm gonna acknowledge that we're moving in the right direction. Um, drawing attention that, that their behaviors are tied to positive outcomes. Let's get more of that. So I always wanna reinforce how behaviors and outcomes are connected. Um, the student has to own it. And I've had to shift this. And I know as parents, you'll have to be mindful of your language in terms of, what are, you know, when is, when's the exam of, you know, uh, we're, you know, we're going to get into college or, you know, we're applying, um, we're applying to Swarthmore. Or said, no, no, no. My daughter's applying. My son's applying. You know, you know, we're taking physics, chemistry. We have, you know, our exam is this. I have to stop myself, your exam, you're taking and, and watch my pronouns. So it's not enmeshment of I'm in there too. No, this is just you. And I'm here to reflect and mirror, but it's not we. And that's a real thing because parents, you know, our kids are so tied to us, but eventually once they're in middle high school, you know, it's, it's you, but I'm here to support and, and help as best I can. That's my roles as a parent and as a, as a coach. Um, and then whose goals we're we serving? There are times as an EF coach, the parents have one objective, but my student has another one. Honestly, what's more important is what the student wants um, in terms of, because kids go into rebellion, kids are, you know, it's, it's good what the parents want, that there's a conversation, but ultimately, the, you know, the children are going to have to set their goals, achieve them, and live with them, um, and then go to, go to a school that, that, that fits them, and a college that makes sense for them, versus what, you know, what did mom and dad want, or how did their older sibling do? That's, that's really not germane to the conversation. It's like, what is, you know, your present, what's your desired future, and not your sister, the brilliant one, or whatever it was, or the lazy one. Those comparisons really aren't that helpful. Um, don't jump in and fix, which is something that I have to always stop myself. I was, was a former consultant, you know, and I would, my role was to go in there and fix stuff. 
And, and with, with, with students though, you want to build a skill and build independence. So it's active listening, framing, sharing back. And I, I definitely do give some suggestions, but it's not, you tell me the problem, I diagnose it, here's the answer. That's, that's pretty lousy coaching. You're not really building independence and autonomy. Um, you're, you're, build, you're building dependence when you, when you become the guru. Um, and you're gonna push them, you know, encourage them beyond their, their zone of comfort, and into, into the place where they start to you know, have some challenges, developing, developing some frustration tolerance, very important. Um, students, when things go wrong, you ask them, you know, talk to me about what happened and what's going on again without judgment, but let's, let's unpack it. That's one of my, frame, my, my favorite phrases, let's unpack this, um, whatever way you wanna use it. Let's break it down, let's dissect it, let's do a ground report. Um, so we got a 65 on this quiz. What happened? What, you know, what kind of questions? Oh, they were asking more abstract questions around this historical thing. And they, or this, this teacher wants very specific things to memorize dates. And okay, so we're learning about what this teacher wants, what that teacher wants. So we're getting very specific when we you know, didn't achieve the goal we set. Um, the um, one thing that is an important piece is simplicity. Um, it's in the eye of the beholder that sometimes a simple task can actually have a lot more layers. Um, and so that, you know, a student seems to not turn in their homework. And that may be like, how do you not turn in your homework? It's where's the breakdown? And part of it is getting very, very explicit and bringing the lens down, you know, very focused. Okay, so where are you writing your homework down? And I've had kids come to me over the years and they open up their backpacks and things are falling out and things are crumpled. And I'm like, oh, dear Lord, like, how would you turn anything in? If, you know, what is your system of organizing? Like I write it down somewhere and I throw it in the backpack. And these are more often guys and it's like, it's amazing. And they, they, they do fine. It's funny. Some of my kids I work with now, it's, it's been almost 20 years and now they're having kids and they're, they're living ha healthy, happy lives. But I remember them as when they were like sophomores uh, in high school and they were a hot mess, but they, they do get better. And now they're working and uh, but ultimately, back then, it's seeing that their systems were just a, a train wreck. And so it's part of it. So where are you writing your homework? Does it always live in the same place? If not, how do you know where to find it? Um, show me. So it's like looking closely at all the steps they're doing. Um, and, and transitions are often places where things can get derailed. Um, the, the going from one class to your locker to another class, going from home to an activities, like that's where things can get lost. Things can get misplaced. Um, and part of it is being able to, and to understand that transition points can be kind of pain points. Okay, I often go and forget my, you know, the basketball when I go to the, the Y, how do I make a note? How do I remember to always bring back the stuff from my backpack? Because again, I'm, I'm shifting from his place to that place. And so do I want to use my phone to remind me? Do I want to write a piece of paper down? Do I want to bring a rubber band on my finger? You know, whatever, write them on my hand. How do I make sure in that transition, I get a reminder? So I, I don't lose track of that thing. Um, and then in terms of, I've definitely seen students going, having challenges at every single phase of completing tasks. I definitely know some of my students have a hard time starting and they don't wanna start or they're reluctant or there are other things more interesting, more compelling. Um, other students, they start, then they go and take a break and that break becomes two hours and they get sidetracked. They start, they, you know, one of my students, he wanted to play music for a few minutes, so it became an hour or they want to play. Well, I have one student is very into um, esports and gaming. He's actually doing some of that next year in Boston um, as a freshman. And his whole thing is if I go into a game in the queue and if I lose that game, I'm going to want to play again. I'm going to want to play until I win. So a 15 minute, you know, little mental break can become two hours. So part of understanding how you get sidetracked. And then finally is task completion is finishing, following through, turning in. And there are some students who go all the way and then they drop it at the end, they leave it at home or they you know, so, so part, part of it is understanding where along the spectrum challenges occur for EF. These are all part of negative functioning, starting, um, persisting, and then completing, and then seeing, you know, what's going on. And Sarah Ward, another EF coach, talks about, you know, the, the future sketch of, if I understand, I have to have a five-page paper due in two weeks, planning all the steps, stopping. And, you know, I, uh, I, I, tell, I talk about, you know, sharpening the saw, that's a metaphor I use. And like, let's take five minutes before we do any session for studying. I wanna stop and I wanna plan this out. I wanna, even if we have a two and a half hours tonight to do all of our subjects, let's stop, let's prioritize. What's the most cognitively intense task? That one goes first. Which one can I push if I need to? 
that one goes last, which one, you know, and I actually go through, and we start, before we start writing, some kids just start with math. It's like, no, 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 let's stop and take a few minutes before we do anything. Um, and this in a similar fashion, if I know I have this five page paper, some kids just jump in and start. It's like, stop all of that. And often like, you know, and, and writing is one of the most EF intensive tasks there is. Um, you think about that in terms of, because a lot of my students, especially younger ones, they just like their, their prose just comes in a fire hose. It is not structured. It is not organized. Um, their things are, you know, and it's, and you know, kids are, some are in the high school, some of them go to college like this and their writing is just, they're, they know vocabulary, they're smart kids, but they're missing that element of stopping, framing, ordering, structuring, prioritizing this actually is more important. Why don't I put this in the next paragraph and also transitions from here to here. So, so writing is really an area that you can hone is that your, your EF skills. And, and if, you, if you get better at that, at that it'll obviously it pays off forever. I'm learning how to write effectively. Um, and so again, it's, it's, it's the planning. And it's, it's so many kids don't plan before they write, don't plan before they start a paper. So the whole thing is like, what's our objective? What's our thesis? What do we need? And if, if I have a five page paper due, like, okay, do you wanna get it proofread? How much time do you need? How much time will they need? Will you need you know, an outline, a draft, sources, checking things? And we write it down. And, and my thing, I, I push them always to allocate time, uh, like a spreadsheet, like how much time do you think this piece will take when you want to finish by? And so again, I'm showing them this process versus they wait till the day it's due and then start. And then suddenly it's, oh man, I underestimated. I, I, I put them through this exercise of estimating. And, and then afterwards we process, how did it go? How accurate were you with your, with your judgments? Um, were you well calibrated? Or you know what? This took half the time. This took three times as long. And as they do this, they begin. They become better. But it's you asking them to you know to help them um, go through this process of estimating time, and then that they, they get better at that. Wow, this wasn't half an hour. This was two hours. Um, and so again, it's this whole planning ahead. Um, a big part of EF is planning. Um, then the next piece, systems. Uh, there isn't a single student I've worked with over the many many years where we haven't talked about calendars. Um, planners, timers, um, what are your tools? Um, and I always show them my Google Calendar and I show them because part of it, I'm naturally not the most organized person on the planet. I am not. Um, I tend to work in spurts. I tend to do things last minute. I, I, I've made a life that works for me and it has worked well. I've done very well academically and in, in the world of work, but part of it is there are tools I use to help me in my style and my system so I don't get into serious trouble. And uh, the way, you know, I often, I'm a time optimist. And so, but for my, my calendar, I would miss flights. I used to fly a lot before the pandemic. And I, in my calendar, I have everything structured. When I get up, shower, clean up, when I, you know, get in the car at the airport, you know, go to parking, park my car at the airport, get out of the car, which rental car you see, which hotel It's all structured. And I show my students. So it's not, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to New York, I'm going to Seattle. Everything is laid out piece by piece. And then I have, you know, I have to be at the school, even like if I know there's traffic, if I have a gig at seven o'clock in Northern DC, okay, I'm leaving at four o'clock traffic driving. So everything, I'm using my, my systems and I show this like into my kids and, I, I, and, and part of it, what works for me may not work for them at all. They may need a paper system. I have students who love crossing things off. And so there's no satisfaction with, with digital. I have another student who likes seeing the, 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 the 11 by 17, Paper calendar, big assignments are up there. They always know what's my month look like in one shot with big things circled. I don't need that, um, but my students, some of them, so part of it, whatever I think is great for me doesn't matter. As parents, what works for you doesn't really matter. A great system is only so good if it's being used. And so part of it is understanding, and some kids love paper. And like, I hate paper, but some kids like, oh, oh that is great. Um, but I, I do love reminders. And I love using my G calendar, my iPhone calendar. I love everything synced up. Um, but again, some people like paper and, and they do fine. And they, they, they get A's. So there's no right or wrong. It's just you know, whatever is used and is effective. That's what matters. So organization um, or mentally organizing, but your digital space, your physical space, how messy, how much stimulation. One of my students, uh, my college kids, he, uh, <laughs> he would get, get sidetracked when there was like laundry on top of his desk and he wouldn't do things. Um, and if just getting rid of the laundry off the desk and suddenly things began to flow better and they could see his checklist, his calendar. So the simplest things of your environment really matters. Um, there's a book I liked called Atomic Habits. This guy, I think it's something smart. 
um, really a great little book about like habit stacking and triggers and cues. And if you get things, if you get your environment right, a lot of things flow from the environment. So versus trying to change yourself, change willpower, change initiation, motivation, just get your environment right. And it does have to work for you. Um, that really is a big deal. And I, I, I've experienced the same thing. Like if I want to drink more water, it's not you know, me, me telling myself, you know, drink more water. I still have a sticker over here, uh, water every hour. But what's better than that is I actually keep a thing of an analogy in full on my desk. And then it's just, bam, it's there, I get more water. So I can either you know, use reminders or I actually change the environment and it totally helps. Um, so systems, habits, how do you track things? How do your folders work? How do you manage your paper folders, your inbox? And we actually go through and see what's organized, what's chaotic, what kind of plan are you using? Um, you know, nudging them towards good routines, good habits. Overstimulation, not great. Typically, it's going to be a challenge for kids, too much clutter. Um, because a lot of kids, all the clutter, they have to inhibit, you know, focusing on the clutter or the distractions. So I want to a clean, and even if your bed's not made, I don't care about that. Even if there, there's a piece of clothing on the chair, but your workspace, I want that a certain way. So I, you know, know where to find things. I know um, everything is, is, has a place in the workspace. Everyone remembers this a couple of years ago, Mary Kondo, clean slating. My wife and I still fold our shirts with the Americano way, and we got rid of a lot of things. Um, does this spark joy? Part of it, you know, like what is in the way? How do I minimize? How do I get things? How do I reduce? Rather than having like 15 pencils in my backpack and I have two or three that I really use and like, decluttering, how do I find things I need? Um, simple, good systems, examine everything. Some people like labeling things. Um, I used to label like in my binder books, homework here, class notes here. Um, handouts here, three hole punch. And so I keep everything in place um, versus the big undifferentiated stack of stuff. Um, I, I would like it to have it structured. So when I'm doing review, okay, let me review the vocabulary in this whole section. Let me, the dates here, the class notes, the, the quizzes versus chronological to me is not as strong, but again, some people like that. So uh, whatever works for you, as long as you use it, it's good. Um, and we're going to, again, tailor a system, customize everything. Whatever the kids need is what we do, not what, what works for you. Um, that's it. Making habits automatic, uh, really a big piece. So again, big, big calendars. Some kids love these. 11 by 17, and they write down the big tasks, the test on the 12th, paper due on the 17th. And they see the big things coming for the week ahead. They can see it all in one shot as they're planning and thinking about the week. Um, and also, your digital environment is a big deal. Uh, things aren't chaotic. Um, I, I'm a huge fan of G Calendar. I use it constantly. And I actually help students like think about when they're going to take breaks and structuring in breaks. Um, and like I did a lot of work for my kids during exam periods, both for the AP exam periods and then later in the, the college exams. Let's put in when are we, you know, when's our break? We're going to be playing basketball here. Let's do our calculus here. Let's do econ here, micro, macro. Let's do French here. Um, and, you know, because in, like this. And so no big, huge blocks on differentiate, but actually breaking it up in smaller pieces. Um, that's all. And, that, and then part of it, I show the students the first week, then they show me. So again, I model for them. And then I go, then maybe we go, then you go. And then I observe and, and we talk and, and give feedback. But you want them to be doing them, not you giving it to them completed and finished. Um, again, backpacks may be helpful, maybe a thing to organize for the students. Um, engineering environment. And for me, you know, it's a big piece of how many distractions do you have. The cell phone's a big deal. A lot of my students uh, have vowed to keep the cell phone charging in the kitchen for the work. Other students wouldn't go that far. They're like, I need to have Snapchat. Uh, I have a friend I, I snap with if I'm sharing homework and having questions. But is there a way to lock it down so only certain people um, can access your phone at certain times? And you can do that. People in like certain contact lists, um, you can close, you can lock down other apps like with the uh, screen time app on the iPhone, where you can say between the hours of four and seven o'clock, all these are turned off except for this one or two apps I can use. The rest are gone. All my games are locked down and everything else. Fortnite's closed off, but these other ones, and you can you know, set the timer right there on your on the screen time app on your iPhone. Your desktop matters, how many things you have open, what's pinging you. You want to be careful. I remember it's probably 15 years ago now, and a student who was really struggling. And she was getting no sleep and staying up so late. And she was like homework, she was seven hours a night doing homework. And then I asked her like to describe, for, you know, what, what, how do you do it and what's open? 
And she ended up having, like she was doing chatting and open and social media. So her seven hours of, of work was actually probably three and a half, three hours of work. And the rest was social. And it was, everything was getting compromised. The social wasn't as fun because you were kind of back and forth with work. Your work was, you're doing much more shallow processing and, and, and pairs and coding. You're not gonna remember things when you're constantly being distracted. It's all inefficient and it was killing her sleep. So what I try to focus on is having clear divisions, clear boundaries, um, you know, off task behaviors. Can I, and I personally, like all of you out there, I'm prone to my own style of distractions. Um, I can get lost going down rabbit holes of learning. I, I love to learn and I'll, I'll get lost in the news and I'll go and spend, I can spend hours, my wife too. It's like after enough heavy cognitive lifting, your brain wants something easier. It wants, you know, it wants not a big lift. So I'll, I'll find an easier to cognitive level task, like reading passively an article versus doing heavy cognitive work like writing or studying. And so part of it for me, I use, um, I use stay focused. Um, and what that is after like 15 minutes I'm, I'm on Reuters or on, um, you know, any New York Times or CNN, it says, shouldn't you be working and locks me up. <laughs> and also in a simple fashion, uh, certain apps, uh, after 10 minutes of the same news things on my Safari, it grays out and locks me out. Uh, and I have to like, you know, reset and things. So I'm a big fan of website blockers. I like to stay focused. There are other ones you can use. You can, some are free, some, some are uh, you pay for. Um, and so uh, Seth Perler, EF coach, love this guy. says, you know, make what's hard easy, what's easy hard. And what that means is, you know, bringing your work front and center. And then what, what's easy, like your distractions, make them harder, put your phone two, two rooms away, lock down your, so the things that are easy, make them more challenging. That's how you manage your environment. Like don't, you know, don't put the bowl of candy right in front of you, put it on the high shelf and put the vegetables in front of you, you know, so it's effortless. We're, humans aren't really good at willpower and it gets worse over the course of the day. So you wanna make the, the good choices easier for yourself. Uh, timing is a big deal for executive functioning, learning how long things take, uh, learning about breaks, um, I love the, the Pomodoro is great. I just personally use my Apple watch and I use my iPhone for timing things. If I need a 20 minute break, I'll give myself a, a timer and have my kids learn how to do this. So they don't, you know, their, their, their 10 minute break becomes an hour um, learning how to structure this. And then clear distinctions. When I'm working, I'm working. When I'm playing, I'm playing. And I tell kids, I want to have more good play time. But that means when I'm really working, I want to focus, but also, you know, taking a proper break. You can't, no one can work for three hours straight. The brain just gets you know, glucose depleted. We all need breaks. We're going to move our bodies. But, you know, I don't ever want to be commingling, getting distracted, ping, ping, pinged. I'm trying to study because that'll totally impair my, my ability, my success with the outcomes. And finally, it's more of a global piece. One of the shifts I've ever really made in the past few years, um, 15 years ago, I, I would talk more about academics. I'm talking much more holistically now with my kids about their life, about their their, their diet, their sleeping, um, their exercise. I, I saw this for, firsthand. Many of you may have also, if you, if you watch your kids from the pandemic, um, one of my best friends, his daughter went through this, went through hell actually, because she was so social and so active and, and then working remotely was devastating for her socially, psychologically, mentally, it was, it was a hot mess. And then getting her back with friends and with exercise, everything changes. Um, one of my students, um, Donovan, he was really, really struggling when suddenly he began you know, he, at home during COVID, then he began going to the gym, moving his body, exercising and everything got better. So it's like, there, these things are totally locked in. Like how you're doing with your physical health, your body is tied to your performance in school. Um, you have to, you know, it's feeding the sharpening the saw, feeding yourself. Um, exercise is amazing for mental health, for, for everything. And also for memory consolidation, it's for the good stuff. Um, sleep. I can give you a book, um, several books on sleep and how it affects learning and memory and encoding of material and memory consolidation, long-term potentiation of, of long-term memory. So like sleep is when memory gets encoded. If you have disrupted sleep, erratic sleep, you're gonna forget a heck of a lot. And many of you know this to be true and you've experienced this, that a regular sleep cycle is what gets encoding and, and long-term memory transfer. It's really the, it's essential. Uh, during the nighttime when we're you know doing some REM sleep, the hippocampus actually is doing this really fast super looping of neural connections. We, we learned uh, that we played once during the day, it'll play them a hundred times a night really rapid. But if you're not getting good sleep, you're not doing that rapid reinforcement, which then encodes them into the, into the, 
the cortex and other places. So you, you need sleep. You need to have sleep um, if you want memory consolidation. Got to have it. It's how we learn. Um, breaks are really, really important. Often with EF, kids who spend too long, it's like, stop. You're at a point of diminishing negative returns. Take a break, go outside. Like, again, this is part of metacognition. When you're reading, studying, it's like, it's getting harder for me. Stop. You're, you have depleted the glucose stores of your brain. Your neurotransmitters are getting exhausted. Go outside, do something non-cognitive. Look at a tree, use your, shoot baskets, move your body, play some music, whatever it is, and then come back. Um, you have to replenish your brain because again, work with, you have this brain and it, it can't go forever. It's, we aren't machines. Um, it's knowing yourself, knowing what you need, knowing the kind of how long you can go before you need a break. Um, Self-talk is a big part of it. I, after I got my degree in counseling, I, I don't let kids say things like I stink at this or I'm bad at taking tests. Uh, I, I'm going to poke holes and punch and look for disconfirmatory evidence to the contrary of their limiting self-belief. I, I don't like limiting self-beliefs and I never let kids, I, they, I always challenge them. Um, like, was there ever a time when you did okay in math? Was there ever a time when you had did okay on test? And what, you know, what do you need? And what, you know, not just global, this global black and white, I'm bad at blank. I'm like, no, 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 that's way too general. I can't let that go. Um, and part of it is, you know, getting them calibrated um, getting them more positive, like their self-talk. And I'm trying to be the good coach, reinforcing, you know, um, so they internalize my voice at some point and they don't need me as much. Being positive and, you know, helping them focus on the wins and the positives and so forth. Uh, one key thing with EF skills is help seeking, knowing when you need more help, knowing when, you know, it's, it's time to seek out more support resources, which is a major life skill. Um, how to self-advocate in high school and then of course in college and then and, and beyond. Um, because you know, this is a I see this all the time. I have my kids in college. How do I get the help that I need? And if you as parents provide it, once they're out of your house, they, they, they have to have this skill to know I need help, I know how to get help. Um, high level takeaways, um, the kids have to own it, complex tasks, you know, uh, simple things may be much more complicated smart systems, and then the whole holistic, the student, not just the, the academic focus. There's one thing that's interesting. Um, there's a little quiz for EF skills, learn.appleruth.com forward slash EF, EF dash skills dash quiz. So then we, we, we built kind of assessing your EF skills. Um, there's also a thing we're doing this massive, we did twice a year, this a sale in December and June, where we're giving discounts on EF coaching, academic tutoring, you buy it for the fall. And of course, SAT, ACT prep. Um, so these are things that we do. And um, we're, we're doing a big sale for this next uh, few weeks. Um, and then last but not least, Apple Ruth, what we do, EF coaching, academic work, and test prep. So I want to open it up. We have time. Um, it's 8.53. Uh, I have my Q&A box open. And I'd like you to ask any questions, things you'd like, uh, any feedback, um, anything you want to respond to in the talk something you're curious about, you know, I'm happy to share what I know. Again, we're gonna share a copy of the deck with you and, and, and the recording, feel free to share it if it was helpful or watch any part again that's, you know, you wanna review. Are there any questions I didn't answer to your satisfaction? Or do you have something about your own kid or something you've heard or? Well, maybe we don't have questions and that's okay. Um, in which case, I will say everyone have a lovely evening. Uh, uh, thanks for coming out and we'll, we'll do more over the next few months. And, uh, and there's a question, um, oh, setting up a one-on-one a -on -one evaluation, just reach out to Apple Ruth, we'll do, we'll do a free eval. Um, we'll, we can talk to, to you, talk about your kids' needs academically. Um, just uh, you know, email info at Apple Ruth or that number there on, on the line. Well, we're happy to help with that. Um, any, anything else? Um, all right, y'all. But if you need help, reach out to us. We're here. Otherwise, hope you have a lovely uh, summer evening and week. Stay cool out there. If you're in the South, especially, it's pretty toasty down where I'm from. And, um, and oh, how often do you meet? I start off doing twice a week, and then I go to once a week. And then um, with my students, sometimes it's every two weeks. Then for my kids who've kind of graduated, it's only when they're coming upon a big challenge, they have a big paper, or they're, they're about to hit exam week, they want more support. 
but you know, typically pretty soon after our beginnings, I'm doing once, once a week and I like doing half an hour sessions. Um, I like keeping them short and sweet. Um, and I, I think, but in the very beginning, I'll, I'll do twice a week as I'm getting to know the student and their schedule and their level of challenge. But then quickly, I, I just like doing a little bit less. I like, you know, I, my, my thing is what's the minimal scaffold I can provide? Because I, I don't want to be a crutch. Um, but I, but you know, as I'm diagnosing and getting sense and learning their systems, I'll do it more frequently, but I'll start to withdraw the scaffold pretty quickly until then, you know, I'm there half an hour a week. We talk, we check in and there we go. Um, oh, how long are students in the program before they have the ability to work on their own? I mean, they're working on their own out of the gate. These kids are very, um, I'm just trying to improve if they got C's or if they had, you know, I'm trying to help them if, if the goal is B's. Um, and so it's, you're going to see changes within a few weeks. Typically, as you start asking questions and you know, what's your system and calendar, but it's it's going to be you know every student is different, um, but you know all students have the ability to work on their own. It's just I, how effectively um, are they using their time effectively, their resources effectively. Um, but I, I always believe that you know students can be very independent, very autonomous. Um, do we have work over the summertime? A little bit. Uh, there are some. I, I do more of my work around the actual content of academics. So a lot of my students, I'm gonna be seeing them right before school, talking about systems, what do you have coming up? And then immediately after they meet their teachers and they find out, you know, what is this teacher like? What do you have, what are your challenges? Can you, can you rank for me your hardest classes? What do you think will be challenges for which classes? What, what resources, what help do you need to make sure you do as well as you can? Um, and also he's talking through, you know, how do these teachers evaluate you? Are they more paper-based classes? Is it more homework? Where does homework matter? Where does homework matter less? Where does class disrupt? I make sure they're thinking about strategy about for each class. So to me, it really is specific about the, the work. So I, I do less work over the summer unless we're doing writing work. Because writing, again, is very EF intensive. Planning, structuring, organizing, prioritizing. We definitely do work over the summer with writing skills um, because that is one of the key foundations of academic success um, you know, for, for so many subject areas. So we do plenty of work and, but, but a lot of it will start, you know, late summer before school starts and then we'll pick up from there. All right. All right, y'all. I think that is it for questions. Um, please reach out if we can help. We'd love to. And everyone have a great evening. All right.